Christians in Science hosted their Coping with Controversy conference online. Now this event was an opportunity to open up and explore some of the big issues and topics within the church that we can often find quite hard to talk about, mostly because there is such a wide range of views on these particular issues. We heard from some brilliant speakers and these recordings are available to you now. But, and this comes with a, a bit of a disclaimer, you may not agree with these speakers, you may agree with these speakers, but what we want these talks and recordings to do is open up the opportunity to begin talking, discussing and listening to each other about how we understand these issues for the church. So however you choose to uh, use these resources, we hope you find them valuable if it's just for yourself or maybe to begin discussions as a small group or community. So, um, thanks for inviting me to talk. And the uh, title that Steph and I came up with when we were preparing for this was, as on your screen, mental health. I'm not supposed to feel like this, am I? And the I'm not supposed to feel like this is um, stolen from uh, the title of a book, which is why I've put it uh, up on the slide as well. Um, and I think it's a great title. So the book is by Williams, Richards and Witten, and it's um, aimed at uh, Christians who uh, are experiencing anxiety and depression and are wondering whether um, they really should be um, as Christians. And um, I love the way the title captures something that I don't think is really a controversy, but is perhaps a conflict. And the conflict is between theory and lived experience. And the theory is that Christianity makes us immune from mental health problems. And the lived experience is that it doesn't. And in certain circumstances, it may make us more prone to mental health problems. So clearly this is a very big and complex topic and I can only raise a few of the issues that we have uh, in the time available. So I'm just going to suggest a few avenues for further reflection. And I'm going to focus on one mental health condition, probably the most common, and that is depression. And there's lots of ways of thinking about depression, but one way is to look at it as a continuum that begins um, with the idea of a certain sort of personality being a kind of Eeyore-ish kind of person rather than a Tigger-ish kind of person through to at the far end having full-blown um, diagnosable major depressive disorder and in between a whole range of states um, being prone to low mood, dysthymia technically, uh, experiencing a one-off depressive episode or experiencing a pattern of depression and sometimes mania together, um, which puts you at the far end of the spectrum. So going from a Eeyore-ish personality to being in a bad place. And how do we define what being in a bad place looks like? Uh, in terms of um, diagnostics, some really helpful questions to ask I've put up on this slide. How do you come to a judgment that things are not okay with you or with a person that you're concerned about? The first question you might ask is around the concept of normality. Does this seem normal? Is it normal for that particular person? Is it normal for that particular person's culture? Is it normal for the situation they find themselves in? For example, if somebody is weeping profusely, is not sleeping, is not eating, can't concentrate, but you know that they have just lost a loved one, then actually, although that behaviour is in some sense worrying, it's relatively normal. We recognise it as part of a bereavement reaction. Another question to ask is, does the person seem out of touch with reality? Does their response seem like an overreaction? Or is what they're doing kind of weird in some way and difficult to comprehend? What's the degree of distress involved? Distress isn't always bad. In the Christian tradition, 
points that out to us very clearly. Distress can sometimes be a stage on the journey to a better place. But if someone's very distressed, we need to pay attention to that and ask, you know, what is going on? Is this actually in the way that pain is often telling us we need to give attention to something that might be wrong? Psychological distress has a similar kind of um, function in messaging, alerting us. Is this situation dangerous? Is the person a danger to themselves? Is the person a danger to other people around them? Is this stopping that person getting on with their lives? And crucially, the life they want to live, not the life we think they should be getting on with. And finally, how long has this been going on for? The longer something goes on, the more concerned you would be if you come back to that bereaved person a year later and find they are still weeping, not sleeping, unable to function, um, not eating. You might be much more concerned than you would have been shortly after they had lost their loved one. And all those considerations are brought to bear by mental health professionals when they are making a psychiatric diagnosis. They don't just look at symptoms, they ask these kind of questions around how worried should we be? In the case of depression though, there are of course, as in all mental health conditions, particular symptoms you would look at. And um, I've taken this from the American system for diagnosing mental health problems, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association version five, DSM-5. And you'll see from the slide, there's a whole series of specific symptoms you would look for if you were suspicious that somebody had was going through a major depressive disorder. So you have not to have all those symptoms, but you have to have at least five and at least one of the symptoms with an asterisk next to it. So depressed mood and depressed mood. Some people would talk about depressed mood as being something akin to deep sadness, but it's probably more accurate to talk about a sense of emptiness of not being able to feel emotion and then markedly diminished interest or pleasure in the things that you'd normally get pleasure from. But if you look at that list of symptoms, I hope you'll notice that an awful lot of them are very physical in nature. And so the whole kind of um, nomenclature of these conditions as mental um, is in some ways misleading. And this connects back with our previous presentation on what we understand a person to be. Um, we are affected in our healthcare system by a split between mind and body that we've inherited from the Enlightenment and from before that from um, Neoplatonism. So an important thing to bear in mind that actually all mental health conditions, but we're looking just at depression here at the moment, is a condition that affects the whole person. It's not something that's just in your head. It's physical, it's socially and relationally defined. It has a very striking cognitive um, aspects, which I'll come on to, clearly emotional aspects, and also spiritual aspects. And I find it quite useful to draw a parallel with type 2 diabetes, both begin with D. Um, both of them are caused by an interplay of multiple factors impinging on the affected individual who has to learn to manage this condition and to live well with it. And sometimes people manage to recover completely from type 2 diabetes, but very often they just have to live with the condition and learn to live well. And like diabetes, uh, depression is increasing in our society. And this is probably to do with a, um, the interplay between the predisposing factors in individuals, stresses that impact on them directly, and the wider social context and culture. So one particular whole person model of health that I have found useful, um, and particularly in my previous life as a clinical psychologist working in a complex neurology, um, is the WHO, World Health Organization, model of um, uh, in, uh, international classification of functioning. So WHO, ICF. So I've already talked about DSM-5, which is the American system for uh, uh, diagnostics. Um, the European version is the ICD, 
uh, uh, ICD-10-11 at the moment, comes out of the WHO, the World Health Organization. And they have a complex, um, but helpful, I think, uh, way of summing up what having an illness or a health condition entails. And they say that any health condition makes itself felt at a number of levels simultaneously. The level of impairment, where you have a structural or functional problem in an organ or in a cell or in subcellular activity. Problems uh, at the level of activity limitation, problems with what are called ADLs, activities of daily living, being able to get out of bed, make a cup of tea, uh, go for a walk. Um, and then at the level of participation restriction, problems with social roles and relationships. If you have an illness that impacts on your mobility, uh, there's certain things you won't be able to do. And perhaps one of those will be to care for your children in the way you would like to be able to do it. And that will impact on your uh, ability to occupy the role of parent in the way you might like to. And all of these things play out simultaneously and the, the way they play out is influenced deeply by the particular physical and social context in which the affected person is living their life. If you think about that model, you might want to later on run some health conditions through it. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to run COVID through this kind of model. COVID appears to be uh, a very physically uh, defined uh, health condition. Um, but actually, if you start to think about it, uh, you realise there's a huge amount of kind of social uh, impact of the condition as well. And it's possible to have absolutely no problems with activities of daily living because you have, you have symptomless COVID. But if you tested positive for it, you will have problems, uh, at least uh, short term problems in um, occupying particular roles, occupational roles, for example, because you'll be told you have to self isolate. So this model um, gives us a kind of way of looking at illness, which I think does justice to its complexity. And none of these levels uh, trump any of the other levels. They're all important ways of describing what is going on when we say that somebody um, has an illness or is living with a health condition. So this next slide, um, the book on this slide is a book that I wrote um, quite a while ago now. Um, and in one chapter in that book, I look at Jesus's approach to healing as it's uh, told us in the Gospels. And I look at it through the lens of that model that I've just presented to you, the WHO ICF model. And as I looked at the Gospels through this lens, I noticed that the particular health conditions that we hear about uh, in the Gospels, the most common ones that Jesus is said to have addressed, are those that have a particularly heavy cost in terms of social participation in a first century Jewish context. So for example, leprosy or gynecological bleeding, the woman with the hemorrhages, or what I have called here demonization, and I've called it that because the Greek idiom uh, where these kind of conditions are described in the Gospels is literally uh, people are demonized rather than possessed by demons, which is how this is often translated. And if you translate that idiom literally, as I have done, as demonized, um, it has a, a different kind of feel to it, and it reminds us that um, being a demonized person involves social exclusion as, as part of the health condition itself, or let's say the human condition for the moment without necessarily buying into the fact that this is a medical condition. So I've given some examples there um, of extended healing narratives uh, of these particular conditions. And if you look at how Jesus healing is then described in the gospel narratives, um, he is seen to heal people at every level in the WHO model. He is um, attentive, his healing is attentive to impairment, to activity um, limitation and to participation restriction, but it's particularly attentive to participation restriction, belonging 
social participation. So in Matthew chapter eight, the lepers who are healed are told to go to the priests so they can be declared clean and welcomed back into their community. The woman with the hemorrhages is called into the center of the um, story. She begins in the periphery, she's outside of the group. She's called into the center. She has to bear witness. So she takes on uh, um, the, the role of witness, disciple, even apostle in pointing to what has happened to her. Um, and she is addressed by Jesus as daughter to confirm that she is part of this community. And then if you look at the instructions to the demonized man of Gerizah in Mark chapter five, he tells him to go home to his friends. That's all part of the healing narrative. So the healing as it's presented in the gospels is about the healing of the whole person, the whole person in their context, in their social context, in their community, but also by implication, the whole community is addressed through the healing. So it's the person in the community and the community. And I'll come back to that point shortly. And I want to return to um, depression now. And I mentioned before that um, depression has lots of aspects that are very distinctive. And one of the aspects is um, cognition. First of all, if you are depressed and given it's so common, I expect some of you will have been, in, and I'm sure all of you have know people, known people who are depressed or have been depressed. Um, it's really hard to think. You get kind of brain fog. It's really difficult to make decisions. That's why in older people, um, very often they think they have dementia when in fact they may well have depression. They present rather similarly. But it's not just the quality of your thinking that is affected in depression. You have a particular style of thinking. You have a propensity to think in certain ways. And the uh, cognitive therapist Aaron T. Beck describes this um, in terms of a triad, the depressive cognitive triad around three themes. The worthless self, I am worthless. The meaningless world, world, life has no meaning and hopeless future. So at this point, I think that one starts to get slight kind of alarm bells, slight concerns in one's mind as a Christian, because these ideas uh, are mirrored in the gospel, but we see the opposite. The gospel tells us or tells me that I am not worthless. I am worth more than many sparrows. I was bought at a price. I'm so worthwhile that God paid for me through the death and raising of his only son. The gospel tells me, this is why it's good news, that life has meaning. God has a plan and I am part of that plan. And the gospel tells us that the future is full of hope and that hope extends beyond death. And so our natural reaction to that good news is to receive it with joy. That's the point of it. So if I don't feel this good news, but in fact feel the precise opposite, that I am worthless, that life has no meaning and that the future is hopeless, almost diagnostic of depression, then I, as a Christian, might be led to the conclusion that I'm not supposed to feel like that. And by not supposed, I mean, well, it shouldn't be this way, should it? Or more strongly, maybe I'm not allowed to feel this way. Maybe if I feel this way, I'm committing some sort of transgression. Or maybe a, a worse kind of thought, if the gospel is such good news and I don't feel it, but I in fact feel the opposite, perhaps it isn't true. Both of those thoughts are bad thoughts to have. And if you're already depressed, they make a bad situation even worse. So I just have a few thoughts to offer um, around that kind of conundrum, really. And the first one relates to the nature of joy. Joy um, is not the same as extroversion. So it's not being 
tiggerish. You can be joy. If you're deeply joyful, if you're a deeply introverted and quiet person, you'll just kind of express it differently. But more importantly, it's not the same. And I think we're all aware of this, at least in theory, it's not the same as happiness and it's not the same as pleasure. And in the New Testament, joy is not presented primarily as a feeling, but as an attitude or worldview that we need to cultivate. So, for instance, in James chapter one, he writes, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Consider it nothing but joy. Work at looking at life from this perspective. Secondly, Paul presents joy as a fruit of the spirit, the second of the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter five. And he sets joy and love and peace and all these other things uh, not against negative emotions like anxiety, uh, depression, uh, sadness, um, but against moral qualities, works of the flesh, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry. He's not primarily talking about feeling states when he's talking about joy here. And perhaps more important even than that is that he's talking about a quality of the whole community. That it is the Christian community that shows the fruit of the spirit. And that when some find it hard to express the fruit of the spirit in certain ways, they are carried by the rest of the community and the offering and the outcome is something that they do together as a corporate exercise. And that this is a work in progress that is not finished until we meet Christ face to face. And that point about the community bearing the fruit of the spirit relates to the understanding of healing that I talked about in the gospels as something that's actually at work on the individual in the community and on the community as a whole. Now, another thing to think about, which comes more from the um, discipline of psychology of religion is that this distinction that we experience in our everyday life between head and heart knowledge um, is something that actually is borne out by cognitive neuroscience. So there are a number of different theories, but perhaps the most popular postulates two forms of uh, information processing systems. Um, one a propositional system and one an implicational system and they're underpinned by separate neural pathways and they are those two systems are not always in synchrony with each other which is why i can believe that god loves me because that's what my faith teaches me and i hear it in church every sunday and i know i should believe that and I do genuinely believe that. But at the same time, I can find it impossibly hard to trust God personally, because trust is mediated through the implicational processing system. This, by the way, explains why so many atheists are so angry with God. Okay, they don't, propositionally speaking, they don't believe God exists implicationally speaking, they're angry with him because they know the kind of God they don't believe in and that kind of um, other uh, system of processing. And there's lots of evidence to show that these two systems work best when they work together, but very, very often they separate from each other. And that implicational system, which is very tied to our bodily responses, um, is affected uh, much more by physical factors than the propositional propositional system, by medication we, we may be on, by our hormones, by how much sleep we've had, um, by our life history, because we learn to trust people at a pre-propositional stage. We learn to trust people as small infants and children before we can articulate ideas about trust and trustworthiness. We know who to trust and who not to trust. And as we come towards the end of our life, I've done a lot of work with people um, with dementia, that kind of system kicks in again. 
And people with dementia who have very little left in the way of propositional processing, sure as anything know who they can trust and can't trust because they're relying again on the implicational processing system. So parenting, early experience, physical factors, and then just the situation you are in um, will impact on your propositional, uh, implicational processing. So if we come back to the terms of head and heart knowledge, which are a bit easier to get your tongue around than um, propositional and implicational, we have a reasonable degree of control on our head, of our head knowledge, but it's very hard for us to control our heart knowledge. Um, it, there is a lag and it takes time for our heart knowledge often to catch up with our head knowledge. And um, cognitive behaviour therapy, maybe some of you have experienced cognitive behaviour therapy or cognitive therapy, is actually based on the fact that head knowledge and behaviour change before heart knowledge and feelings, and they catch up later. And religious, Christian religious traditions that focus on establishing holy habits and practices rather than focusing on feelings, also understand this principle. But what about um, the healing of uh, broken heart knowledge? Most psychotherapeutic approaches involve some kind of reparenting because the ability to learn trust and a sense of self-worth um, is laid down so early in life. And they are underpinned by principles of warmth, acceptance and unconditional positive regard for the affected person. And that happens in one-to-one -one therapy, but we know that this also goes on in healthy communities and it actually goes on better in healthy communities. You're, you're not dependent on one therapist. So there's lots of evidence to show that levels of mental ill health are lower in religious people, especially if they are engaged with their faith community. And in pastoral care in passing, there should be no lone rangers. The way we do pastoral care should be done as a community for all sorts of practical reasons. Paul himself, earlier in Galatians, gives us a model of this when he talks about his own weakness and a condition that afflicted him, and we don't know what it was and whether it's the same thing as the thorn of the in the flesh that he talks about in 2 Corinthians. But he talks about coming to the Galatian church and the way that church showed him so much love that they met the test that his condition set them. It's quite a radical way to put it. You might think of his condition being something that was sent to test him. And indeed, that is how he talks in 2 Corinthians. But here he's saying, a community is judged on the basis of how it welcomes and supports somebody who is in some sense weaker. And the last thing to say about that is that this is a long game. Think how long parenting takes. Um, Reparenting someone who has, for whatever reason, is in a bad place in terms of their heart knowledge of self and of God takes a long time. And that's why it takes community takes a whole village to raise a child is a bit of a cliche, but it's deeply true, like a lot of cliches. So um, can I have five more minutes to go on, um, Steph? Is that all right? Yeah, of course you can. OK. But just some downsides. Um, for people who are already depressed, the church community can be deeply healing, but there are aspects of the Christian tradition that can be unhelpful that can consolidate a sense that I am worthless, that can support unhealthy feelings of guilt and of shame by getting structural and systemic sin muddled up with personal individual shame. And that has gone on right through the history of the church. And it's deeply ironic because the good news of the gospel is that we are free from shame. Shame is the affliction that Adam and Eve are subject to in Eden when their eyes are open, they look at themselves with self-loathing actually. It can also be um, destructive if you have unhelpful understandings of what healing is that are promoted. 
and I'm hear this all the time, so I expect you've come across this too, but people who have been told they haven't got better from whatever health condition they have because they have not prayed enough or they have not had uh, enough faith or that the reason they haven't got better is that they have been afflicted by um, demons and need deliverance. Now that sometimes can be an issue, but it's overused. Also, Christian tradition can be unhelpful because this theology, a distorted theology, distorted in all sorts of different ways, is taught from the front or in Bible study groups or whatever in a church setting. But also, and we pay less attention to this, but it's really important that when you are depressed, you have cognitive biases. So you don't just think you are worthless. You attend to stuff in your environment that tells you you are worthless and you ignore stuff that tells you that you are worth something. So you listen to the bad news and you filter out the good news. So here's a, an example I always love to give of um, cultural cognitive bias. Um, Romans 3, 23 to 24. Most people who come up through an evangelical tradition and actually quite a lot of other Christians as well, know Romans 3, 23 very well. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the way it's punctuated in the NRSV invites you to read the text that way. But if you look below at a literal English um, translation of the Nestle Alland uh, Greek text, um, the text is, is really rather different. It's not since all have sinned, it's there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So in the original, you have this incredible universal good news. Since we've all sinned, and we're all in the same boat, we're all justified. But somehow in our tradition, we have focused on something rather different, which is we've all sinned. And I bet you know Romans 3.23, and I bet it's much harder for you to retrieve Romans 3.24. And that's an example of cultural and group cognitive bias. But apart from teaching, there are other ways that the church can be inhospitable to people with depression or living with other mental health conditions. Now, this picture on the right is from an episode of The Simpsons, where I think Homer Sim the people who go to this particular church that Ned Flanders is invited to have to actually put a smile on before they're admitted. So first of all, a lot of our church worship demands mental stamina, which is precisely what people with mental health conditions do not have. And many other people too, like people with dementia, people with specific learning difficulties and children. The themes that we talk about are potentially depressing. For example, that all have sinned. Church is by definition social, and that's a good thing. But if you are living with a mental health condition, it's the most difficult thing in the world to be sociable. And it may expect you to be cheerful. And gosh, that's hard if you're not feeling cheerful. And one of the real, real difficulties of going to church for people who feel miserable is the sheer effort of pretending not to be miserable. Really, really difficult for those of us just on a bad day. But if you're depressed, it's, it's asking almost the impossible. And it's asking you to lie and not to be yourself. A bit more optimistically, and I shall finish in a second, ways that churches might help. Hospitable worship. I once was talking to a mental health chaplain who um, also had lived with depression for a long time. And she said to me, you're an Anglican. What in your churches are clergy trained to do in terms of what has to be in a service to make it legal? So I said, oh, well, we have to have the Lord's Prayer. We have to have a piece of scripture. We should have to have a psalm. We have to have a gathering at the beginning. We have to have a dismissal. And she said, no, stop. I don't mean that. I mean, do you have like a rule that every person who has been into your church service leaves knowing that God loves them unconditionally for who they are? Is, is that like one of the rules that, that happen when you train clergy? And I was totally ashamed when she asked me that question. Ashamed, I think, in a good way, because that's exactly the rule we should be having. But it wasn't the rule that was in my head. Two other things, 
self-help and support groups. There's a lot of very good Christian uh, self-help support groups for people living with mental health problems around. And churches, some churches are doing really good work in that area. We could do more. And the other is Christian meditation. So that book on the slide is one that I wrote with colleagues, which is kind of reclaiming mindfulness um, and the uh, tradition of mindfulness and meditation in the Christian tradition, um, which helps people live well with all sorts of issues, including mental health problems. We had a question earlier during your talk um, asking if there are any specific studies that confirm the levels of mental ill health um, being lower in religious people, as you say, um, because uh, this person said they remember as a friend referring to anecdotal evidence um, that low mental health issues um, is about the same as those that live in a group of a strong community feeling. Um, so do you know what sort of research is out there in terms of- There's um, masses of research. Um... The person who's done most work is Harold Koenig, K-O-E-N-I-G, um, but there's absolutely masses and um, it's a very well established um, correlation between um, holding a religious faith um, and lower levels of mental and physical ill health. Um, but just to pick up the question, uh, that still begs the question of why is that? Um, and what's what's at work and more recently sort of atheists who've got annoyed by this have, have actually started to do work on uh, communities where there is a, a lot of cohesion and people are very committed um, where there isn't a formal religion uh, which draws people together and um, there are a small number of studies that suggest that, that, that levels of health and well-being are, are better in those communities as well. But there does seem to be something distinctive about having a transcendent referent. So it's not enough. It's good to belong to a community where you have a common ideology and you set an identity and a sense of belonging. But there seems to be added value uh, in um, a kind of reference to big questions and um, ultimate concerns. What there aren't studies on is comparing different kinds of faith community, other than some early work that suggests that people are a bit more prone to depression um, in the Jewish faith. But that affects all sorts of stereotypes of Judaism, of people just being a bit miserable. Um, and it, 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 it's a really good example of the real problem that bedevils all of these sorts of studies is how, what, the measures that you use. So you have to have good measures for health, but you also have to have good, much more problematic good measures of what it means to be a faith community, um, what it means uh, to belong to that faith community, what aspects of belief are the things that seem to be important. But, you know, a lot of you will be social scientists. There are very big number of studies and that this is a strong uh, trend. Unpacking why, it, why it's there is much more problematic. Just, just to finish as well, just to say that when I first came across that work, I was really surprised because I just kept meeting people of faith, my own faith Christians, who were um, struggling with mental health conditions. But that's just a measure of being a mental health pro professional. You think everybody's miserable because you just see them. Great. Well, um, we've had another question come in, uh, which says, uh, it's quite long, so um, I, I, bear with me as I read it. Um, secular mental health solutions often centre around self-care, whereas you talked about the role of community in the church as helping tackle mental health issues. To what extent is the idea of self-care um, or would self-care be helpful for Christians um, as in their under emphasis in wider society on the role of community? Um, I think probably both are important. You know, um, it's one body but with many members. Um, and so you have to pay attention to the individual and the community. You have to take responsibility for yourself as part of that community and as part of that you have to attend to self-care and one of the problems in both Protestant and Catholic traditions I think has been a reluctance to care for self uh, you know and it, this is some of the kind of theology that needs I'm not saying it's wrong but it needs looking at with a critical lens of um, self-sacrifice and martyrdom and something called kenosis you know this kind of emptying of self or the losing self to gain eternal life um, or servant ministry 
or what we understand humility to be, not unrelated to the idea of kenosis in Philippians 2. So um, how do you turn those theological notions into um, things that actually bite in terms of how should I live my life? How should I understand myself? Is it okay to care for myself? There's quite a lot of theological reflection to be done about what we understand those things to be. Um, there is some evidence that there are ways and ways of doing self-care. Um, some that kind of flip into a selfish kind of narcissism and some that are actually what we would call healthy and life-giving. And perhaps one of the things that would be important for church communities to look at is instead of saying, never think about yourself, always put others before yourself, or um, be a total narcissist, is to actually look for a, a more kind of nuanced range of approaches to this and say, what would a good, a bit like with pleasure and the body, what would be um, a godly way to care for self? What does it mean to care for self in a way that is consistent with the gospel? And it's something to do about with, to come back to the question on community, but understanding your place in the community. You know, if one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. We are interconnected and we need to pay full attention to that. And we also need to be honest um, and transparent. And that means being prepared to say, I am hurting, which is part of what forgiveness is about. You mm. hurt me. Um, what can we do to heal this? I think that that point about self-care is a, a, can be a really difficult one for Christians um, because I, our society, I guess, tells us that we should be me, 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 and part of being a Christian is not thinking like that. Um, so, so to, as you say, try and find a godly way of looking at that. Um, it, it would be really important. Um, I, I've seen people myself that have suffered by being so selfless they end up in actually a, a really poor state of mental health because they haven't received back what they need uh, because they don't have that established community around them uh, so I yeah that point on self-care is is a really interesting one to, to and actually Jesus provides a good model for that in his own life um, in terms of caring for himself caring for his disciples, being happy to receive care and service when it's offered. So this person says, and I'm sure we can all relate to this um, in, in some way or another, that um, it can be quite easy for us when friends talk about depression or anxiety to simplify these to being sad or scared, uh, although they understand that this is much more complex than that. Um, this doesn't take away from my desire to support these individuals but why does the gospel not inspire confidence and good mental health amongst all Christians? Well that's such a big question I I think it's to do with that that the, the short answer is to do with that head and heart knowledge thing um, so that I think I think it can act at the level of head consistently I think it can act at the level of heart inconsistently but there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff that holds us back and it's different things for each of us. And for some of us, it's the stuff that feeds these mental health conditions. Um, I suppose I would also go back to this idea of it being a long game. I think the gospel does address these things, but it doesn't address them in an instant. And I think we, particularly now, we're looking for quick fixes, but uh, I think naturally we're, we're predisposed to look for quick fixes. And to be fair, the gospel presents healing as if it happens in a moment because of the nature of the narratives that we're presented with. But the whole, one of the difficulties of applying the New Testament to our life here and now is not simply that it all happened a long time ago, but that it all happened in a very compressed period of time. And we are living between the times in a, a kind of much more marathony than sprint kind of context. And part of interpreting the Bible for here and now is not simply to do with what's in it, but the time frames involved. So I'll wrap up in a second, but quite a lot of what goes on towards the end of the Gospels are instructions for how to wait well. You know, my master has been in a long time in coming. Um, don't go to sleep. You know, it's going to be, the Lord will come when he comes. 
you have to live your life as it were in anticipation and that may be a long wait and there's all sorts of issues around the difficulty of that and one of those is asking the question why doesn't the gospel fix this now and one of the things perhaps we need to bear in mind is there's an eternal dimension to this and that things will happen in God's time and part of being faithful is to cultivate perseverance you know which is a fruit and a gift of the spirit this sense of keeping on keeping on and that's particularly true in mental health or actually in all health conditions uh, i should wrap up in a second but you know you should ask this que yourself the question why do most greeting cards that we send to people who are unwell say get well soon you know, what is the what is the soon issue at work there there's nothing more passive aggressive if you've got a chronic health condition and getting a card that says get well soon it's 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 not a helpful thing so it's that time thing um i think that rather than it's not that the gospel is not powerful it's that our time and god's time are not in sync